Okay, so it looks like we have a good group going. So welcome everybody. This is Heather Riggs with the New England Museum Association. Uh, I want to welcome you today to a webinar on website accessibility uh, with the folks at Gore Place. Um, we are happy to have them here today. Um, telling us, um, giving us a little bit of tips and trips tips and tricks on website accessibility. So if you guys just want to type in the chat feature where you're actually viewing this from, that would be great. And so I want to introduce Emily Robertson. She's going to be doing um, the hosting today. I'm just the background here today. Um, so she will get us going. And then like all of our webinars and town halls, um, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the NEMA website later on this afternoon. Um, just in case you have to leave a little bit early or if you want to share it with your colleagues, that would be great. Um, so Emily, I'm going to uh, transfer it over to you. Excellent, wonderful. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Thank you so much, Heather, for that great introduction. Um, let's just get us on our first slide here, and then we'll get into the heart of the presentation. All right. Yes, yeah, so anyway, well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. We're so glad that you've decided to spend a little bit of your time with us today to learn about a topic that I'm really passionate about, and, um, and my co-presenters are also equally passionate about website accessibility. Um, we wanted to start off by, first of all, um, letting you know that we are offering live captioning during this webinar. Um, this captioning is today is being co-sponsored by Gore Place. Um, and the way that you can access the live captions is to click the CC icon in your Zoom window. Um, so you should see somewhere on your Zoom window a little icon that has CC that stands for closed captions. Click that and turn on the captions and then you should see them playing in the bottom half of your screen. And live captions are essentially um, the text readout of what's being spoken during the webinar. And they're not being done by a robot, they're doing, being done by a real person. We have somebody typing them for us and that's what makes them live. So that's really exciting. So if you've never seen live caption before, um, you've never had an opportunity to look at it, please go ahead and turn that on and check it out. All right, excellent. So before we start our presentation, I wanted to say why we were hosting this presentation during this particular week of the summer. We picked it because this week we are celebrating the 30th birthday of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, this is landmark legislation that was signed into law on July 26, 1990, and that's this coming Sunday. And a lot of organizations throughout 2020 worldwide have been celebrating this birthday. This is landmark civil rights legislation that really um, solidified it, but into law um, civil rights towards people with disabilities in all aspects of life, things like transportation, employment, and telecommunications. Um, they were, the law was amended in 2008, um, and it also follows up from law that was written in 1973 that was also still on the books. So this landmark legislation really um, is carried through time um, and really solidifying those rights for people with disabilities. So happy birthday to the ADA. And on the screen, I have a photograph with a, a cake with two candles, three zero for 30. All right. So I want to let our presenters um, um, say a little bit about themselves before we get into the heart of the presentation. Aaron, why don't you go ahead? Hi folks, my name is Aaron Rowley. I'm the volunteer coordinator at Go Place, and I also run the accessibility projects at the museum. Wonderful. And I'm Emily Robertson. I'm an independent consultant based in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and um, I do marketing and other special projects for Gore Place, and I help to redesign the site working with our colleagues at Tunnel 7. And um, I've been really passionate about accessibility work and I've been, been a student of accessibility for about 20 years. And there's, I always consider myself a student because there's always so much to learn. All right, Emily, why don't you go ahead? So I'm Emily Carpenter and I'm the owner of Tunnel 7. We're a web design and digital marketing firm uh, based in Portland, Oregon. And we worked with Gore Place on the rebuild of their website late last year. And website accessibility is really becoming more and more important for a lot of our clients. So um, really happy to be on this webinar today with you all. Wonderful, thanks. I'm so glad to have Aaron and Emily um, with me today to talk about this really important topic. We're hoping to, um, in this topic, I'd like to say that this presentation is designed for people that have essentially no knowledge about um, uh, website accessibility. You don't have to have any level of technical knowledge. I'm not a programmer. Aaron is not a programmer. Um, 
but we're hoping to convince you that if you don't yet have a web website that's accessible, that you'll consider building one. Um, and we're hoping to share some information that will kind of make that easier for you. So if you do have questions of any kind, please feel free to put them into the Q&A and we'll grab them and we'll do our best to answer them during the presentation. And if there's something that we don't know, we're happy to get that information for you after the presentation. So please uh, feel free to ask us questions as, as they go along. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about more about today's agenda. Um, today, we are focusing on websites. Now, websites are really the front door to your organization. Um, whether you're an independent consultant with a business, or if you have a personal website, or you are working at a museum with a museum website, they're really the front door to your organization. Besides your social media pages, they're really the first place that visitors come to before they actually set foot on your site. And so making them accessible is so incredibly important to meet the needs of all people, including people with disabilities. So we're gonna cover a very foundational question to start with in our agenda, which is what is an accessible website? And then Aaron will lead us into some conversation about his personal experience with website accessibility. Next, we'll look at Gore Place's website as a case study. And then Emily Carpenter will lead us into answering questions such as how can I make my current site accessible? And finally, Aaron will wrap up our discussion to answer the question, how can I convince my decision makers to, to invest in this work? All right. So we wanted to give you some context that we'll use to help understand Gore Place's website. We wanted to introduce you to Gore Place. Gore Place um, is a nonprofit museum and farm located on the Waltham Watertown line in eastern Massachusetts, Massachusetts, just nine miles west of downtown Boston. You can see in this photograph that's on the screen right now, this is an aerial photograph taken up above Gore Place's 50 acre estate looking east towards Boston. And we can see Boston on the skyline, those skyscrapers over there on the right hand side of the photograph, the upper right corner are the skyscrapers of Boston. So it's incredibly close and you can see the density of the city around the property. Um, and this little jewel box, this little oasis in the city. Gore Place has three historic buildings and interprets early 19th century American history. Two of those buildings are open to the public. It also has a working farm where it raises heritage breeds of sheep and chickens. It offers programming year round um, to the general public. It has about, um, in a non-pandemic year, about 60,000 on-site visitors um, at programming that it offers, and more than 100,000 visitors to its website and social media channels. Um, it has uh, more than 15 full and part-time staff members, a board of governors of 22 members, and more than 75 volunteers. It has a web, uh, excuse me, um, an operational budget that's just under a million dollars. It is accredited by AAM and was designated a National Historic Landmark by the National Park Service in 1970. Um, it's also um, sponsored in part by the Mass Cultural Council. We do receive um, a lot of support every year from the MCC and we're always so grateful for that support. In particular, the MCC um, welcomed Core Place to become part of its UP program, which is an initiative of the MCC, the Mass Cultural Council. The UP program stands for Universal Participation or UP. And this is a professional development program that helps um, nonprofit organizations throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to become more accessible throughout their entire operation. Everything from employment, communications, day-to-day -day operations, you name it, they cover it in the program. The program itself is about six months to start with. You do a capstone project as part of it, and at the end you receive your UP designation, and Gore Place did receive that last year um, in 2019. And then each year you do work to maintain that designation. And so Gore Place, I'm bringing this up because Gore Place had had um, a focus on accessibility Accessibility for many, many years that was really solidified by the UP program and got kind of everybody moving in the same direction towards that initiative. That has since expanded into a DEAI initiative that stands for Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Inclusion. And so that work has really kind of um, dovetailed into a DEAI initiative. So we want to tell you a little bit about the UP program because that'll come up a little bit later in our presentation. All right, so we wanted to answer that question, what is an accessible website? If you don't know, it's okay. It's not really an obvious question, is it? Or that has an obvious answer. Um, but let me share a, a little bit about it. So if we can think about a building that has a set of stairs up to the main entrance and there's no ramp to get up to that entrance, there might be no way for somebody who's using a mobility device like a wheelchair to access that main entrance. 
So websites are similar to buildings in that way. If they aren't built with accessibility features in mind, then the content on the website would not be accessible to somebody using an assistive device like a screen reader. Um, and many people with, with disabilities um, use assistive technology devices to access um, websites online. Um, and so it's really important that websites become accessible. So an accessible website is one that is designed with features that allow it to be allow the content on the site to be accessed by people with disabilities. Um, I wanted to point out an organization, if you've never heard of it, the W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. And this is a, an international organization that sets forth protocols and standards about the web, um, how it exists, how it operates. Um, and they have something called the Web Accessibility Initiative. This is a working group, uh, international working group of people all over the world that have set forth guidelines and standards for website accessibility. So thinking about the features of a website that make it accessible, things like having the text to be able to be read by a screen reader, um, standards about how a font might appear, how big does the text need to appear, thinking about um, color contrast, what color contrast is easier to read than others, and many, many other things are set forth in the guidelines that the Web Accessibility Initiative has set forth. There are three areas um, that the Web Accessibility Initiative um, covers, three sets of guidelines. The main one that I want us to be concerned with, and if you remember nothing else from our presentation today, I want you to remember this acronym. The WCAG stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And on the slide I have here, that's right in the middle of the screen. They also have guidelines for two other areas, the ATAG, Authoring Tool Accessibility Guidelines, and I'll read the third one, UAAG, User Agent Accessibility Guidelines. The ATAG um, talks about guidelines for um, areas where people might be creating their own content, offering their own content, things like blogs um, and social media pages. And then the UAAG concerns developers that are building things like browsers um, and media players. So for website accessibility in general, um, and certainly the one that we want to be concerned with today is the WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, the guidelines have um, a number of different factors. This is where stuff can get really, really technical, so we're not going to get too in the weeds on this content. Um, but there are three levels, single A, double A, and triple A of conforming standards. And for Gore Place's site, we actually ended up going with double A, and we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Um, the guidelines change periodically. There was a set that was created in 2008, and the most recent set, 2.1 was created in 2018. And those are updated periodically by that working group. All right, so that's kind of a, a primer for website accessibility. I'm gonna just check to see if there are any questions at this point before we go on. I'm not hearing that there are, so okay. I think I'm just gonna go ahead and pass the microphone to Aaron. Hi folks, so I'm Aaron Welling again and um, I do have a visual disability. I was born with retinopathy of prematurity. In other words, um, to give you a little background on my vision, what you can see about 18 feet away, I have to be a foot away to see the same thing. So that means I do use um, accessibility software to access the internet. Um, typically, what I um, look for in a museum's website is I would go to their accessibility page and their um, their directions page to find out the public transportation, obviously. And if I'm not able to access those pages, the doors, so to speak, to the museum are closed to me, and it puts in a bad precedent. Um, typically, the easiest things for me to do to make a website accessible. Uh, from my personal experience have been contrast, uh, like high contrast, uh, white text on a black background or um, the opposite, um, as well as audio described videos, um, closed captioning like we have today, and um, easy, simple navigation so I can go down the list using a screen reader um, if I might need to. And, that, uh, oh, yes, on this slide, we have a list of disability statistics. 26% um, of um, people in the United States have a disability, 
and that's broken down into ability, hearing, and vision. Um, however, uh, making your website accessible doesn't necessarily have to be solely for people with disabilities. It can also be for people with situational disabilities, such as you may have an accident and you can't use one of your arms or uh, temporary deafness or um, other extraneous circumstances that don't allow you to use a website in a certain fashion. That's why accessible websites, like the ones we're going to be talking about today, can assist you in uh, performing the same tasks. So, um, and also 100% of people in their lifetime will know someone who either has a disability or um, will grow into having a disability over time. Next slide, please. So uh, what I'm going to show you now is one of the webs, uh, one of the applications I use to access the internet. It's called ZoomText, uh, made by Freedom Scientific. So uh, you'll see on the screen, I have a, um, the screen enlarges by using this software. Also, we can do color enhancements, um, such as dark uh, background with white text. And I also have a text-to-speech um, read around there. So if you wouldn't mind playing that video. Sure, absolutely. Thanks. I'm just, everybody knows, I'm going to fast forward a little bit to a point at which in the video that we can hear the Zoom text reader actually read what's on Gorpolis's website. It's reading it from the back end. So it reads buttons, it reads a logo, and some other things. So if you can't quite hear it that well, it's actually reading out what's, um, what's printed on the website. All right. I'm just going to... Get it to play. So now Aaron's going to navigate to Gore Place's website on the video. I think that is just about it. Okay, and that's the end of the video. Um, I wanted to say something, Aaron, just about, just so folks know that um, you might've noticed when Aaron's cursor hovered over the Gore Place logo and it read out the phrase Gore Place logo. So how did it know that was what it was? That's because there's all descriptive text built into the website that the screener reader identifies and can actually read out. Yes. And a lot of our photos and videos also have that alt text built in um, due to our new accessible website. That's right. You might have heard that phrase for our audience, alt text. It stands for alternative text. And it's basically descriptive text that's built into the back end of the site. And if you add that text, then the screen reader, that's what it actually reads to identify what an image is or something like a video or something graphical that, it, that um, otherwise we might not know what it is. All right. Are there any questions before we move on? Nope. Anything, anything in the Q&A? Okay. Nope. Okay. All right. Great. I think we're all set with this slide, Aaron. Shall I, right. move, shall I move to the next yeah, one? You, yeah, you can move okay. on to the next one. Great. Wonderful. Okay, so in the next section, um, Emily and I are going to be talking about Gore Place's website as a case study. Gore Place's website is at goreplace.org. If you want to go look at it right now. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the process that we took um, to identify um, what we wanted the site to end up having, what were the goals of the site, and then also hiring, ultimately hiring Tunnel 7 to redesign the site. So we went through an RFP process that took about two and a half months. Um, we had decided that the site had um, 
Well, let me back up. So I mentioned earlier the UP program, the Universal Participation Program, as part of the Mass Cultural Council. As part of that program, um, the participants are very fortunate to get an audit conducted of their website by WGBH's National Center for Accessible Media, which is probably one of the best places in the world for understanding accessibility in places online and elsewhere. And WGBH um, is a um, our local um, Boston um, radio and television station. Um, so the National Center for Accessibility, Accessible Media is an excellent resource and we will have their link at the end of the presentation if you want to check them out. So they produced a website audit of goreplace.org and there were nine sections on the audit of areas that we were flagged that we were not compliant with accessibility standards. And they were things like missing descriptive text, um, interactive pieces on the site that were not accessible, um, things like um, a lack of um, keyboard accessibility. If somebody is using a keyboard to navigate the site, the site was hard to do that if you're using a keyboard. We also knew that the site had, uh, we wanted to make updates to it about marketing conversion goals. We wanted to really um, look at the site again and change it quite significantly. So when our team looked at either redesigning the site from the ground up or adjusting the site that we currently had, we decided it was more cost effective to redesign the entire site. So that went, that's why we went to an RFP um, process to identify um, firms that might be interested in that job. I want to tell you a little bit more about the RFP process. In the process, we actually published an RFP that included everything we were looking for in the new site. Um, and it also included our website um, accessibility audit. It's a, it was a four page document that we attached to the RFP. And then it made it really easy to tell developers and I didn't need any technical knowledge. All I had to do was show potential developers, these are the things that we needed to fix. And that meant that we could talk about them really easily in, during the RFP process. So I wanted to say that if you are nervous about hiring a developer, making sure that you know which one to pick, who's, who is going to build you an accessible website if you decide to redesign or adjust your own site, it's actually very, very easy. All you need to do is say to them, you want it to be WCAG compliant. Um, put that acronym right into your RFP. And then as you're talking to firms who are interested in submitting a proposal, you'll know which firms you're most interested in, in talking to because those are the ones who are gonna be able to tell you a lot about how they test and evaluate for WCAG compliance. So that's web, web content accessibility guidelines. It's really as easy as that and you don't need to know anything else about the technical end. Um, so we put that into our RFP and um, in the process, Tunnel 7 rose to the top and we ended up hiring them to rebuild goreplace.org. All right, I'm going to pass the mic over to Emily and she's going to take us on a, a little bit more of a tour of that process. Thanks, Emily. Um, and maybe let's just switch screen sharing. So. Yeah, sure Here. thing. I'm going to stop sharing now. All right, so I think just to, as Emily Robertson has been saying, things can get fairly technical fairly quickly here. So I don't wanna get us into the weeds of too much of the details of individual aspects of the WCAG guidelines. I just wanna give you a sort of a bigger tour, an overall tour and, um, of the site and, and walk you through some examples of some of the decisions we made as we were building this site. Um, and just to say sort of for all of the websites that Tunnel 7 builds, um, we really believe that good thinking at the beginning um, is going to serve you well. And so with all of our clients, you know, that means starting, but starting with, um, you know, having conversations about the goals for the site. In this case, obviously, we were really looking at accessibility, you know, the WCIG AA guidelines. So we knew that from the start. And then we also had conversations early on about the content, the types of content that we wanted to have, or that the, you know, the Gore Place wanted to have on the site. So, you know, in terms of content, we're talking about images on the site and, you know, pages with copy and videos and that sort of thing. So knowing that kind of upfront helps us throughout the, the whole process. And then we also had co some conversations about, you know, certain types of functionality. Like you see the, I'm showing right now, the homepage of the Gore Place site. You, you see the donate button here, the membership buttons up in the, the right corner. Um, so making sure that that process 
process that um, we, we kept those uh, donation process in mind in terms of accessibility. There's also a little shop um, on the on the website. So we had conversations about how to make that the, the it's not exactly an e-commerce. Um, we didn't end up going with that for the shop, but um, just having conversations about that in terms of accessibility as well. So I'm just going to share a few examples here, some of which we've already talked about a little bit. But one thing with um, the accessibility guidelines that Aaron mentioned is color contrast. So um, as you see here on the home page, um, the two main colors in the Goreplace color palette are this light green and the dark green here. Um, and so we made, this is actually, we made decisions in terms of the design here. Um, uh, we used the, this lighter green as more of a highlight color because um, of color contrast issues. So I'm just gonna show you now, I'm gonna move over to a tab that shows you, this is a tool, there are a lot of handy online tools that can help you with things like checking color contrast, just generally checking the accessibility of your site also. So this is a tool from WebAIM and basically this, this tab here shows you this is that light green that's part of the Goreplace color palette and this is the white that's you the white color that's used on the site and you can see uh, having the the light green with the white text that fails the guidelines here that fails the standards so we can't really do that but then if you look in this next tab I have the dark that turquoise dark green blue color. Um, that does pass. So that was part of our thinking in terms of, you know, the layout and the design of the site here. Um, and then in terms of content, I mentioned images, uh, you know, written copy on the site, video, interactive maps. Um, so just in terms of some of the thinking around those things, Emily Robertson mentioned earlier the alt text. So uh, again, that's descriptive text that basically, it's a piece of code that tells, uh, you know, a screen reader what the image is. So it's really important to have that on all images on your site. So this is an example. This is a page page, um, the collections highlight page on the Gore Place site. And I have um, uh, sort of a, the code on the site, the HTML code on the site open on the, the right. And um, it, yeah, I mean, this is a little technical, but you can see this say more, see more bookcase, uh, there's alt text here. Um, so this is the, the alt text is say more bookcase photo here. So you can see in all of all of the images on the site, there's a field. So when you enter, when you when you upload a new image to the site, you can enter in that alt text um, really easily. And then in terms of written content on the site, um, a lot of the guidelines, the WCAG guidelines around this are really just good practice in general for creating a, a website that users can use easily. So it's things like, you know, is the content uh, clearly laid out on pages on the site? So I'm just showing you now the visit page on, on the site. So we have an image at the top of the page. And then the content below the image is broken up into headers. And so all of those headers are important, I mean, for all of us to understand sort of the flow of the content. And, you know, web users tend to scan content. That's what they do. We're not reading things word to word for word on, on a website. So it's, this is good practice in general, but it's also really important for, again, for screen readers to help um, folks understand what the content is on a page. Um, other things that are, are important in accessibility and just in general, having a really clean and easy to understand nav main navigation. So here we have five items at the top of the main navigation. We also, if you if you look at the drop down menus here, each of the items in the drop down are um, they're underlined. So that's another important piece for accessibility is making sure all of those items are underlined so that screen readers can pick them up. Um, yeah, so just the, the flow of information needs to be clear, um, really clear pathways of engagement, having really clear pathways of engagement for your users, that kind of thing. Well, if I could pause you for a second, I just want to take, we have one question I'd like to, to grab now um, yeah. from an attendee. The question is, how detailed should you make alt text for website images? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So I would just think of, uh, if you're not able to see an image, you want the text to describe what the image is. So for this image, um, I would say something like, you know, aerial, aerial photo of Gore Place Mansion and surrounding grounds, M maybe you could say even in the fall. You don't want it to get too long, but you do want it to be descriptive enough so that somebody can understand what the photo is. Right, like yeah. one to two sentences would be perfect. Yeah, I always think about it as like, what, are, what is the most important thing about the photo that you want somebody to know? And what's, and what's the content? I know on, for Facebook in particular, there's, for alt text on images, there is a way to add them to um, Facebook posts. It's not a lot of, I think maybe it's like 10 words. Um, so you got to be really, really succinct in what you want to say. Yeah. So this is Heather at NEMA. Um, we actually did do a lunch with NEMA a few months ago um, on the alt text and stuff like that. So uh, we can actually put into the chat feature the link to that if anybody would like to watch that um, lunch with NEMA. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Heather. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, so the next piece I wanted to talk about was video, having video on the site. Um, so we did with this project, we did want to, uh, we wanted to have a, a page with videos and the videos are being pulled in from YouTube here. Um, and so there are a few different guidelines related to uh, video. I'll just point out one uh, sort of small little technical issue that we had as we were, as we were, um, Use it. We were using the code from YouTube um, on the site, and we ha we ended up having to um, just do a little tweak so that this title field here, which is important for again for screen readers to be able to understand what the video is about, um, we had to make a little change so that this we have to manually enter this. But uh, once that was done, then the, the page or these these videos were accessible uh, on the site. And let's see, yeah, I was just going to show you, I, I, again, I have a, so I have a, the Gore Place, a, a video, an individual video on the Gore Place site pulled up and then the code pulled up on the, um, on the right. Yeah, and here's the, the title tag. So that, that's a little bit technical, but just again, to give you a sense of some of the sorts of considerations we needed to make and um, sort of ch small changes here and there that we needed to make. Um, another piece was um, Gore Place has an interactive map. They had this on their old site. Um, so I'm showing that now. Uh, it's the, we moved it over from the old site. The old site doesn't exist anymore. But um, it's basically, um, it's a map of the grounds and there are little points on the different buildings. You click on them and um, well, they, yeah, they, and then there's a little image that pops up um, with a description of a, an image and a description of what each item is. So we had a few issues with this. Um, just again, like alt text with images and some other little pieces of code that needed to be adjusted. And this is actually interesting that this map was was somewhat old to begin with. It's using sort of an old code base. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to show you well, let's go back to the, the Gore Place homepage. So I'm just gonna show you, I'm gonna run an accessibility scanner. So I just did that. There's a little pop-up now that shows um, what we're mainly interested in with this scanner is errors because those are showing that we're not meeting the, the guidelines. So uh, I, I have um, the AA standard here. We don't have any errors on the homepage. Um, if I go over to, oops, oops. I go over to the uh, the interactive map. Oh, it's not showing any errors. When I looked earlier, it was, but uh, <laughs> and that was mainly again like the code base is old. So uh, there's a few changes that we may need to make with this. Just this one aspect of the site that may need to be updated a little bit. But my uh, my accessibility scanner is telling me something different today. So anyway. Um, <laughs> And this just sh you know, shows that the website is. Oh. Yeah, Sorry. go ahead. I was just going to say, go ahead, Eric. it shows that a website is really a living, breathing thing. It can change over time. So if you notice, you know, one small change you need to make now, then, you know, it, it's always evolving. 
Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, as you add new content or, right, if, if things are brought over from an old site that have older code or something, it's, yeah, it's, it is exactly, it's, a, it's living and breathing and changing all the time. So that's very nice. true. We've gotten a question on the Q&A, Emily. I don't know if you want to take a question now or if this is a good time to do that. Oh, uh, sure, if it's related to one of the, the pieces I was just talking about, yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Let me see, uh, an attendee wants to know, are there any specific considerations to account for when trying to make a responsive slash mobile experience more accessible? That is a good question. Um, I think it's mainly, it's, it really is a lot of the same things that we're already talking about. So, you know, um, not really. I mean, you would always run, we, we always check sites that we build, we check them on mobile devices too. Um, but a lot of the same um, issues are, you know, are the considerations on a desktop site would be, would be similar on mobile. Aaron, do you want to speak to that at all either or two? Yeah, sure. So um, typically it is kind of the same thing. I use uh, what's called voiceover on the iPhone. It does typically the same thing as Zoom text. Well, it does have a screen reading part of it. And then there's also, um, you know, display accommodations, but yeah, typically, it's the same process I go through. If I can't either, because I do have vision, um, if I can't see it with, you know, um, some display accommodations or using um, voiceover or other text-to-speech, then a website really, you know, is inaccessible. But mm -hmm. thankfully, you know, we've got websites that are accessible, so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other questions out there? Well, I don't see any right now, but please folks put them into the Q&A if you have more questions. Yeah. Um, the other two pieces I wanted to mention briefly are, um, so this is the donate function. Oops, not that. Um, on the GorePlace sites, and this is actually an integration with um, a CRM that GorePlace uses. So um, it's not, yeah, it's an integration. You'll see that URL is different. Um, and with things like this, sometimes you're limited to uh, what's available through that integration. So I'm just gonna show you, there actually are quite a few errors on this page. Um, but again, it, this is another system that, um, we, you know, we, we don't have control over their code base or anything, so there, there's limitations there. Um, and then the, the shop section of the site, um, we ended up, the way this ended up being built out, we basically have product listings on the site, so you'll see them listed here, and um, then if you click on the item, you're actually linked out to uh, PayPal to pay. Um, so you see the add, the cart, add to cart button here. So th this ended up being a pretty straightforward process. Um, there wasn't an e-commerce integration for this part. Um, yeah, so I think that's pretty much all I wanted to show you on the site itself. Um, any other questions or comments about that? Or Emily Robertson, do you want to jump in at all? Yeah, let me see. There were a couple of questions here that come into the Q&A. Um, uh, OK, one of them is, do you have any suggestions for making websites more accessible for people who use eye tracking software to navigate and type? Hmm. That is a eye tracking software. I'm, I'm actually not sure off the top of my head. Mm. I'd have to get back yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah well, um, we will, uh, for Victoria, we will put our email addresses at the end and you're welcome to email us directly and we can try to get that answered for you. Um, the second question, um, an attendee wishes that we would go over what our specific accessibility page should have. And I think you mean the page about accessibility features or offerings at this museum. Um, I hope that's what you mean. Um, we weren't planning to talk too much about that content, but we certainly can talk a little bit about it. It basically is a, um, a page of text and um, images that describe kind of section by section um, what accessibility features we offer to visitors when they come to visit Gore Place. 
So things like we have a ramp up to the first floor of the um, historic mansion so that people who are using mobility devices or pushing a baby stroller can just roll right up to the first floor. There's also accessible restrooms, so that's on the list. Um, it talks about um, that we welcome service animals, um, sort of all those different topics that visitors might be thinking about. It also has our, our new Know Before You Go video. So please go to goreplace.org and, and check that out. The Know Before You Go video gives people um, kind of a primer about what it's like to visit Gore Place, um, what they might expect there, and what accessibility features might be avail available to them during their visit. All right, hopefully that answered your question. All right, wonderful. So I don't think we have any more questions right now. Um, actually, one did come through the chat. Um, oh, okay. You mentioned earlier the web accessibility evaluation tool. Um, I think that answers the question that came through the chat. Is there an assessment tool for website accessibility available online? Scarlett, do you by chance have that available to put into the chat feature really quickly? Yeah, so they're actually, in terms of accessing our, um, yeah, looking at your site in terms of accessibility, there are a lot of different tools. So the one we use is called HTML Code Sniffer. It's basically a, a website developer tool. Um, it's this, which I can drop in. I like it because um, it's, you can choose the level of accessibility that you're trying to meet and it will give you, you know, just very straightforward answers. Um, so it's very handy that way. Um, there are a lot of different tools, though. If you do, uh, you know, search for accessibility sc standard or scanners, there's a lot here. So, um, you know, I, I would suggest going with this one. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Emily, can you put that into the chat? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Um, I wanted to say also about um, something we didn't mention earlier about. Um, Gore Place's website, I've gotten permission from the leadership at Gore Place to talk about how much money we spent to um, fund the project and actually get the project done. And I wanted to share this just in the interest of being transparent and so that you might understand what it might take for you to do it at your museum, although it's a highly subjective number based on what is actually in your site. So we decided that our project, um, the scope of it was at $16,000. So that was the direct cost. That's not an additional indirect cost. The, the, the direct cost to rebuild goreplace.org over the last year. Um, and that was based on um, factors that we looked at in the industry and also talking to colleagues. Could we have spent a lot more money? Probably. Could we have spent less? Maybe. It has a lot to do with what's on the site. So does your site have e-commerce? Does it have an event calendar? Um, how many pages does it have? Does it have video? All these levers can be pushed and pulled to figure out how much your site's gonna cost. My own personal business site, I spent a lot less than that. Um, and so it doesn't, so adding accessibility features is not a necessarily a, a significant driver of cost. I wouldn't say that it's any more expensive to make a site that's accessible than one, than one that is inaccessible. I don't know, Emily, if you would agree with that. Um, I think going for accessibility features as part of the design process is just part of the design process. And if you incorporate them, it doesn't cost you any more to incorporate those features. So I think it's, it's really important to say, sometimes people say to me, well, to making things accessible is just more expensive. Like putting that ramp on the building is just more expensive. Is it though? In the end of the day, it's not more expensive. And actually goreplace.org now is so much more welcoming to so many more people that we're going to be opening the doors to a lot, a lot more audience, a lot more earned and contributed revenue because we have an accessible website. All right. <laughs> Shall I screen share my next screen? Um, I know we had um, some more questions that we wanted to go through. Um, let me just get that out of the way and find my slides again. Okay. So there were some other specific questions that we thought people might come up with that um, we wanted Emily Carpenter to go through for us. So the first one, I'll read it out. How do I know if my museum's website is accessible or not? And I think you've, you've kind of covered that one, but maybe you can just kind of reiterate some of those points. 
Yeah, I think, you know, the website audit that Emily Robertson was mentioning at the beginning, there are a lot of firms and organizations that can do an audit like that for you. And that can be helpful. Not only they're doing that initial work, but they can help you decipher the results of the audit and also make prior, uh, help you prioritize what needs to be done to make the site accessible. And then there are these scanner tools that I just showed you. So if you wanted to spend 30 minutes, you know, just download that Chrome extension, the, um, the code sniffer, um, and just run a few of your pages through and see what, how many errors you get. Um, and again, some of the errors require some may, you know, maybe a little confusing in terms of the language because it is um, sort of developer, website developer language, but that's, that would be a good place to start. Great. Yeah. The next question we have here on the screen, my site is built using a popular website builder tool. Is it accessible? Yeah, that's a really good question. So accessibility is becoming more and more important these days. I mean, it's always been important, but um, it's it's definitely um, it, the website builder tools like WordPress, like Squarespace, are starting to be more and more on board with um, with it. So you, I. Um, I would just do a little bit of research and see it's, it's basically, you know, it's going to be the theme that you're using. So each of the, each of these, or most of the website builder tools will have some sort of accessible themes, but you need to see if what you're using is an accessible theme. And then thinking about things, you know, with like a WordPress site, or a lot of different sites, you know, you're using, you're often using add-ons of different sorts to add functionality to the site. And those, um, can often not be accessible. So you just need to be clear and, you know, on what you're adding to the site and whether it's tripping, it's, it's creating accessibility issues for the site. Um, so you, you certainly can still use WordPress and Squarespace, all these tools, um, just with any sort of content management system or, or tool, just to make sure that what you're using is an accessible sort of theme or template. Great. Okay. Our third question on this slide is, can we make our current accessible, uh, sorry, can we make our current website accessible now or do we have to rebuild the entire site? Yes, yeah, so I think we've talked about that a little bit already, but I mean, I, I think it really depends on the individual context. You know, if you're happy with your site currently, if there aren't sort of bigger changes that you're wanting to make, you may just be able to run the site through a scanner, make a couple of changes like adding image alt text or something like that, and you might be good to go. If you have a more complicated site or you're wanting to add functionality to the site, um, it may be a different situation then. Um, so I think it's, it's really depends on your individual context um, but you know starting with something and trying to build out using starting with something you already have and start and trying to build out using different add-ons and it, I mean it can get somewhat complicated sometimes so just um, yeah just be careful if you go go that route <laughs> and our last question on this slide is how often should I assess my website's accessibility compliance yeah so again, like Aaron was saying earlier, websites are living and breathing things. So um, I think it's going to depend somewhat on uh, how much change is made on your site. If it's something that you're adding new content, new types of content regularly to it, you may want to be doing more regular sort of running pages through the scanners, that kind of thing. You know, generally, if you're just adding a new blog post or an image here or there, maybe checking every six months to a year, or check doing running things through the scanner. That I think that would be fine. Yeah. And the wonderful. guidelines themselves, as Emily mentioned earlier, the guidelines themselves are not changing all that often. It's every several years or so. So, just to keep that in mind. Yeah, and I know that the current set of guidelines build upon the last one. So if your site had previously been 2.0 accessible, um, there, there may be things you need to do to move up to 2.1, but you're not going to need to fix, you know, absolutely everything. That's my, my kind of layperson's understanding of it. Yeah, wonderful. All right. Um, why don't we move on to our last content section, and then we'll have a little bit more time for questions. Erin, I'm going to pass the mic to you. I'm going to change Thanks. slides here. And oops, I went too far. Okay, so Aaron, the slide um, just has the title, How Can I Convince My Decision Makers to Invest in This Work? And a beautiful photograph of Gore Place's South Lawn. Great, um, thank you. So uh, one of the ways to convince your stakeholders is certainly um, thinking about the current times we live in. During the pandemic, um, a lot of our 
in-person programs have shifted to online resources. So digital accessibility has come up at the forefront of that. We need to, you know, you need to be thinking about promoting accessibility throughout all your digital spaces, not only your website, but also social media platforms as well. And um, by building a more accessible website or adding on to one you currently have, your um, current uh, stakeholders or current members will see this good work and become your brand ambassadors, crow about what you've been doing and also reach that new audience that you want to um, bring in to your institution for more revenue. Um, like I was saying earlier, you know, everyone in their lives may know someone with disabilities. So building uh, the content in a certain way to make it more accessible for everyone, first of all, increases universal design, but also just brings in more potential revenue for you. So it's kind of a benefit to your organization. Um, this also um, puts words into action. As we mentioned earlier, the diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion statement by the American Alliance of Museums you know, puts forth a standard of what you should be doing for your institution. And so you'd be putting those words into practice. Um, and also you might be able to get increased donations from your work on accessibility. Um, certainly there are grants and other corporate donors that could um, potentially offset the cost. Another um, way you can think about this, uh, as we mentioned previously, um, Go Place had a certain amount of budget for uh, website redesign you can think about accessibility uh, by adding it in as a part of your regular budget. And I would also advise um, joining the UP program if you can, because that will start uh, you thinking about accessibility in general and also website accessibility is one of the workshops that we uh, went to and we were already in the process of making our website accessible. That kind of gave us a broader background as well. Um, yeah, Aaron, may I may make an additional yeah, comment yeah, on, the, on the funding? It was, I would say, relatively easy for us to convince our stakeholders at Gore Place to fund a newly accessible website because the organization is already on board with accessibility as an initiative. Um, if your organization is not there yet, um, I might suggest, as Aaron suggested, building it into your regular budget. So we actually took that $16,000 in last year's fiscal, last fiscal year's marketing budget and allocated it towards this redesign. We might have spent that $16,000 on something else, say paid advertising. And we said, nope, we're going to allocate it towards website to redesign because we know that the return on the investment for spending the money on that um, initiative was so incredibly important and the return was going to be high and it absolutely has. I can't tell you what a game changer it's been to have um, a site that meets our conversion goals and also is accessible, particularly during a pandemic. So. Um, if you could go on to the next slide. Sure. So this uh, slide has a list of resources for institutions um, well, nationwide, but also here in the uh, Northeast region. So the first one I believe is, um, does that say National Center for Accessible Media? That's correct. Okay, so NCAM is, uh, as we mentioned, uh, a part of WGBH and they can give you your website audit. That was actually included in one of the um, workshops that uh, the UP program did. So that's a benefit right at the start. Um, the second um, resource is, is that um, IHCD? Uh, it's actually the MCC's UP initiative. Oh, MCC's UP initiative, right. So the MCC's UP initiative will uh, obviously give you that foundation. And um, we actually have a program officer, I believe, um, in the, uh, not in the chapel, like in uh, watching this yes. live for us. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and can you tell me what the third one says? I... Yeah, the third one is the IHCD. Oh, right, yes. So the IHCD... The Institute for Human Centered Design, um, they also were uh, 
portion of the UP program allowed us to have individuals of uh, all different functional limitations view your actual physical site. They also went on your website, um, just non, not as a professional sense, but in a average person, you know, accessing your website. So that will um, kind of get the ball rolling about thinking about um, making accessibility a priority. And is there anything else on the page? There's one more that I added. This is just the website for the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative. So oh, these great. resources, this, these, this slide will be available in the recording. Um, and again, we're happy, if you want to email us, happy to share these resources and more. There's, there's a lot, we could have done many, many slides with resources. Yeah. All right, so we've got about five minutes left. Aaron, did you have anything else you wanted to say here? Um, I would just say that, you know, websites should be universally designed um, for everyone because, you know, while we do have a large disabled population, um, these changes, can really just help anyone at any time. So, so uh, learn all you can about developing uh, your accessible website, either through developers or programs that we've listed on the screen. And you can always email us or contact us for more information. That's right. Wonderful. So I think we do have some questions. Um, I'm screen sharing, so I can't see. Can I see the Q&A? I don't know. I don't think I can see the Q and A as I screen share. So if anybody else wants to read them out. Yep. So one question did come in. Um, will you go over the A, double A, and the triple A um, again? I think that was Emily Carpenter. Sure. Emily, take it away. Sure. Yeah. So those are just the, those are the sort of the three levels of WCAG um, standards. So what we were meeting was the double A for this site. Um, it, the single A is sort of like the beginner level, double A is intermediate, um, triple A is advanced. Um, and it's a number of different criteria in each and like double A meets single A plus it has some additional standards. Triple A meets both of the, the other ones plus some additional standards. Um, and you can see, a, a, I don't want to get again too technical, but you can see a, like a full list of the different, what the different standards are. Um, on that WCAG website. I saw a question come in on the chat um, from Charles Baldwin from the MCC. How has okay. the internal culture of Gore Place changed with this great work on access? That's an excellent question. Aaron, do you wanna take that yeah. one? Uh, sure, so I mean, we've certainly thought about obviously a physical space, um, but also that we're doing live captioning um, at our webinars and also uh, adding alt text to our images, videos, and our website. Um, and the internal culture has just been very positive. I mean, uh, working in an environment with a person with disabilities, I think really has increased everyone's uh, thoughts on the subject, like putting it toward the forefront of everything that we do. Um, and I've certainly been, um, you know, kind of leading the charge internally and at our uh, programs as well. I would agree with that for sure, Aaron. Um, I think that our eyes have been opened across the organization from the board, our volunteers, our staff, consultants. Um, we have more curiosity about how we can be more accessible. And I think the curiosity is really what allows that change to happen. We certainly, certainly don't get everything right all the time. We still make a lot of mistakes, but we try to do our best and to learn more and to do better the next time. Um, and so I think that that's, that's kind of the, uh, the attitude that you need to, to take when it comes to, to making big changes towards accessibility. Were there any other questions? Let's see in the chat. So should we be aiming for um, AAA? Um, in our experience, AAA is fairly hard to meet. Um, it's certainly a worthy goal and, it, you know, 
you could certainly have a conversation with your web developer about that. Um, there are a number of different aspects, though, that we found to be quite challenging. And, and, it, well, and it also just gets to be a fairly expensive endeavor as well. So I would encourage you, yeah, to talk to your web developer and to look at the different criteria for each and see kind of what makes sense for your organization. Yeah, Gorplex was at a double A was going to be uh, just fine and really appropriate for the site that we were going to build. Um, we thought that single A wasn't there and double A was really where we wanted to be. Um, maybe the next site will will change that, but that's what we went for for our site. I just have up on the screen now another slide about how to contact us. Um, I'm going to read out Emily Carpenter's email is emily at tunnel7.com and tunnel7's website is tunnel7.com. Um, Aaron Raleigh, you can email him at volunteers, that's with an S on the end, at coreplace.org. And me, Emily Robertson, my website is emilyrobertson.net. Um, and you can find my contact information and my, my LinkedIn there. Um, I want to encourage all of you to reach out to us if you have other questions or just need support, need somebody to talk to about this cra these crazy things called, called websites. We're happy to bounce ideas around. Um, and um, I guess we are just about to time if there's any other questions. Um, we actually just have a comment from Charles Baldwin, who yeah. is the person in charge of the UP program at MCC. He has joined us today, and I think his final words are great. Um, but don't let being the best prevent you from moving forward. Sometimes aiming for perfect can stop you from doing the work one step at a time. I think that is definitely something we are all thinking about with um, everything going on, current events, accessibility. I mean, it's yes. definitely something that we can all be doing better. <laughs> so yeah. we're doing more, doing more, I should say, on that one too. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today and especially Emily, Emily and Erin um, for you. presenting on website accessibility. Um, we do appreciate that you guys have all joined us and shared your knowledge um, with the NEMA community. As always, if you ever have any um, suggestions for future webinars, town hall, networking events, definitely contact the NEMA staff. We are always open for new ideas. Um, we just might get you to volunteer though, but that's fine too. <laughs> Volunteering's easy. <laughs> but that's what, um, and today's session has been recorded and will be available on the NEMA website. Make sure to check out our up coming um, events. Um, we do have a couple of really great uh, webinars and town halls coming up and we look forward to seeing you at a future NEMA event. Thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you thank everyone you. for joining Bye. us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.